We never fly, ever. And I'm gonna tell you why. Do we wanna get stuck somewhere? No. Do we want people digging around in our personal belongings or running their hands up and down our bodies, taking us into a back room and getting groped, getting your hair fell into? Uh, no, definitely don't want that. Expensive, valuable lifeline equipment getting taken away, damaged for life, not paid for, no apologies, nothing. Hell no. No, we don't want that. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lisa Chapel. I'm a doctor of nursing practice, a professor of nursing, and soon to be a certified health and wellness nurse coach. I make videos for nurses, students, and caregivers on how to become more empowered and resilient. This video is a part of my series on navigating disability. My husband is a C6 quadriplegic and we do everything together. <laughs> I mean, I love that man absolutely to death and I just wanna educate the world on the things that he goes through all the time. He is paralyzed at cervical level six, so if you count down your vertebrae and kind of bend your head and you feel the, the vertebrae that sticks out when you bend your head, that's about C5. So his spinal cord injury is one below that. So he broke his neck. Um, it has now been 21 years ago. He just had his, what we call his crash anniversary. So he's been doing this disability thing for a very long time. We we just have a lot of a lot of tips and tricks and a lot of helpful information for you all. And so I'd like to share some of that today. Recently, there was a TikTok video that went viral with I think to date it has over 13 million views. And this video, let's take a look at it now, was of a woman who is a quadriplegic as well who um, operates a manual wheelchair. She went to fly on Delta Airlines. Her wheelchair got checked below, so she had to tag it along with all the strollers, the other vehicles that go down below, mobility devices, etc. They have to park at the end of a gangplank and they go below the plane. So the owner of that expensive piece of equipment is no longer with it. They can't follow it below and has to entrust it into the hands of others. Well, they had their flight, they, ca they came back to retrieve her chair and it was broken to the point that was inoperable. So the seat rest on the back was completely damaged. It was um, stuck forward. Um, oh my goodness. The wheels were bent beyond recognition, so they wouldn't even roll. And these were special self-propelled wheels. So my husband does also operate a manual wheelchair as a quadriplegic, and he has, has had to work. I can't even tell you how hard he's had to work to be able to push a manual wheelchair because with quadriplegia, some people think of that, you wouldn't be able to completely move your arms or your legs, but that's not true. It just means that there, it could, it could be true. It depends on the level of injury and how high it is. The higher the level of injury, the more severe the result. And so my husband was C6 means, you know, he's got his shoulders, but doesn't have great dexterity in his hands. Everybody's injury is a little bit different. It depends on the level and then it depends on how complete that injury is. But in any case, this poor woman had her chair completely damaged and to the point that was inoperable and they actually gave her the, what I, I would call this the clunker wheelchair because it's the standard wheelchair with the pushback. There's no supporter cushion. The, these are the chairs that maybe grandma would use in order to make it so she doesn't have to walk so far. And so you get grandma in the chair, maybe push her around the airport. And then, you know, grandma would be set because then she'd be able to get up, maybe use a walker or something to walk to where she needs to go. Not the case with someone with a disability such as a spinal cord injury from an accident or some kind of trauma or maybe born with it where the spinal cord is damaged. They're unable to walk, cannot 
walk not even an option so don't like oh going and they're like oh can you stand no he can't freaking stand so quit asking that like people just don't understand and we get that we we do and we want to educate people on how they can be a little more sensitive and not make assumptions about people and i get that it's a question but that particular question is so invasive can you stand up can you walk no don't freaking ask that if someone is in a chair and there's a there's ways to look and see if they are wheelchair dependent or not. There are little cues you can look for based on the chair, based on their mobility. You have to observe for a while. You have to watch. And I guess you have to have some education or some experience in order to do it. And so, okay, all the people who, who don't understand, don't know, we forgive you. Certainly more sensitivity can be taught in these circumstances. I am off on tangents. <laughs> So I'm going to try to stick to what I am talking about here. In this video, I'm going to share a little bit about our experiences with flying and five of the top reasons why we choose to avoid flying at pretty much all possible costs. So we have flown quite a bit, but we any more, more and more, and now I am so much on board with this. I'm so supportive because I've flown enough with my husband now to understand why he hates flying. And so now I freaking hate it too, which let's not even get started about why flying has been an extremely unpleasant experience for a long, long time now. And if I were to use one word that would sum up the entire experience of flying for someone who is a wheelchair user, it would be dehumanizing. The experience is dehumanizing. And so it's hard to feel good about really going anywhere when you have this dehumanizing experience every single time. Every single time. Never ever fails. So from security to check-in, first reason is security. Okay, I understand. We all have to go through security. Nobody likes going through security. But let me tell you why it is particularly horrible <laughs> for a wheelchair user. You, you get up to those scanning machines and I don't even know the names of them where everyone has to go through. You take your shoes off, you put all your belongings in a basket and then walk through there. Well, someone in a wheelchair is not able to walk through there. They're asked right off the bat, can you stand up and walk through there? No, can't freaking do it. Okay, now the chair doesn't even fit through that thing. And so then someone has to actually come do like a pat down and you have to go off to the side. So meanwhile, I can walk through, I can grab all my bags, la la la. And then I have to go watch my husband be violated in multiple ways. Anything from people feeling in his hair, down his entire body, down his legs. Oh, and then they feel a tube. Hmm, what can, what is this? What is this tube I'm feeling? Well, that would be his catheter that he has to have because of neurogenic bladder due to quadriplegia. Anyone with a spinal cord injury suffers what's called neurogenic bladder if in some way, shape, or form. And so things don't quite work like they used to with being able to drain the bladder. And so a person who is a wheelchair user will have maybe a catheter or maybe they will um, use a process called intermittent catheterization where they have to put a tube into the urethra and empty the bladder every so often. My husband uses what's called a suprapubic catheter. And so it's a catheter that's been surgically inserted into the bladder above the pubic bone so that it doesn't have to be inside his urethra, you know, all of the time because then there's other functions for that. <laughs> which we won't get into that on this video. Maybe maybe we'll talk about that someday. I don't know. Maybe he's willing to do like podcast things with me or something. People love hearing him talk. I bring him into my classes and it, it's just like immediately, you know, he rolls into the room versus me who just walks into the room. You take that a lot more seriously, really. I digress. Okay, then once you get through security and get pat down and wondering what is this tube and what's that tube and it's just the entire experience is absolutely horrible 
for someone who's a wheelchair user. Like really there's a bomb on his chair. I get it, I understand. He can't go through the, the other machine that everybody else goes through, but why not make the machines a little bit wider so everyone can go through it? And maybe I'm just speaking from ignorance. I don't understand or I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so then <laughs> let's get to the fun part. So then we go to the gate and you wait at the gate, but then you need to about 7 billion times talk to the person at the gate to tell them, excuse me and be nice, you know, hey, we need to be first on the airplane because we have a wheelchair. Well, once everyone else starts to board and they're jamming their bags up and everything, the last thing you wanna do is be this person who is trying to get through. So God forbid that we get hung up in security because then we need to come over and we need to actually get in our seats. And huh, oh, oh my gosh. It's so painful to even talk about. So, so then we have to get into a chair called an aisle chair. This chair is the only chair that will fit down the aisle of an airplane because it is so narrow to be able to fit down that whole aisle thing. <laughs> because you can't actually fit a regular wheelchair. I mean, I'm not even talking a giant like mobility scooter, anything like that, or a big old power wheelchair. I am talking just a regular wheelchair, a normal size chair, even a pediatric chair, for goodness sakes, won't fit down those aisles. The process of having to transfer into an aisle chair and have the assistance of the people who help, who don't have education on how to assist, they just don't. So that that's where I come in. I, I need to help out with the transfer. I need to be like, back the frick off everyone. Just let us handle this because we know how to do it. Then they're like, oh, you know, we're gonna strap you in like Hannibal Lecter and, and strap all these straps across you. And it's gonna be an absolutely traumatic and horrible experience the entire time. And then don't, don't even get me started. Then once you get down the aisle and there's no room to actually even do a pop transfer over the freaking, what do you call them? The armrest things? Half of them are broken. They don't even lift up. And so then you have to do that. All right, <laughs> so let's talk about choice of seating. If you want a little extra room, then you have to be the one who is seated in those, what do you call them? The exit row the exit row. And so you have to have a little bit more room in the exit rows. Oh my gosh, I'm just gonna cry even telling this entire story. Like this is horrible. Like somebody get this freaking together because it, it's, it's horrible. So then once you finally get into the seat, then you have to say goodbye to your lifeline, which you had to leave back at the, the area where everyone checks their strollers below the plane. You have to say goodbye to this chair that has cost you thousands of dollars. And no, it's not covered by insurance. It's, re it's really not. They'll cover like one of those airplane chairs. They they're not gonna cover a nice custom chair. And what goes into a custom chair? Well, first of all, don't ever let your cushion go. You need that. Don't ever let them have it. So you're gonna take that thing with you to to your seat because you don't ever want to let that thing go. The cushion itself uh, is usually custom made and then custom pressure mapped. So pressure mapping, if you think about if you're a person and you're just sitting in a chair, you're shifting your weight all the time. You're moving around, you're just kind of adjusting your position like I'm doing right now, I'm moving all over the place. Someone who has paralysis and they're not feeling the chair, they're not perceiving that they need to move around, has to do weight shifts. In addition to that, a custom cushion that's pressure mapped for this person is a lifeline in preventing the kinds of wounds that would kill you. It, just in a couple hours, you could get a pressure ulcer that could end up killing you. It, they get infected. Once the skin is broken down, it is so difficult to heal. And I know this video is going to be like 16 videos in one if I'm not careful, so I better just keep it to one. And I'm thinking of like 200 other videos that I could film. 
at this point. So once you say goodbye to your lifeline that's down below, guess what? You're stuck in that chair on the airplane. You are never getting up. It's not gonna happen the entire flight. No, you can't get up and walk, remember? He's stuck in that chair. And so generally we will pick two seats. We like to sit together. We're, we're cuddling cozy like that. You know, we, we love each other. We like to sit by each other. We don't want to sit apart. We'll take the two end seats and then someone else will be by the window. <laughs> well, of course that person is going to have to get up at some point and they're going to have to climb over and they're like, excuse me, could you get up, sir? No, he can't freaking get up. Okay. Do you understand? No. <laughs> Oh my god how many times do you have to be asked the entire flight can you get up no he can't freaking get up okay <sighs> calm down lisa calm down then there's the inconsistency and experience of the workers who are nice people generally they have varying levels of education about sensitivity when it comes to disability generally there's a complete lack of understanding, for example, and I, this is where I love to do some education with everyone that I come into contact with. And so from the time the chair goes below and then I have to go and be like, okay, is the chair coming up? We're going to get the chair right. It'll be the first thing up, right? And so the other thing about flying, the disabled person is the first one on the airplane. Yes. Okay. Oh, you get to be first on. No, trust me. It sucks. So then uh, you have to be the last off first on last off because that chair is going to arrive after the fact <laughs> after everyone has gotten off and then the aisle chair has to come back down get back in the aisle chair strapped in like Hannibal Lecter again watching my beloved hus husband be dropped on the freaking ground like I am crying even thinking about it raising my blood pressure even thinking about this experience which is like the worst some of the worst experiences I've ever had and when you care about somebody you see them go through that repeatedly it's no fun okay it's just not fun <sighs> all right so moving on so, so yes, I like to provide a little bit of education and I'll teach people. Okay, no, his Chris's chair does not have handles on the back. Why is that? Because he doesn't like for other people to push him. He can push himself. And so if you ever see a chair without handles in the back, that's why. It's because this person doesn't want to be pushed. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I do. Provide a little bit of education about the chair, like how it comes together, all the things that it needs. Yes. And they were not joking in that video that, you know, this happens all the time. Literally everyone that we've talked to who's flown with a wheelchair has had similar or worse experiences. We have a friend whose chair just got left behind. They forgot to load it below the plane. And so once she arrived in at her destination, no chair. There is no chair. Great. Now what? <laughs> and I can't even tell you what that results in. So no, you can't just borrow this other chair. Will not work. It is designed for someone very temporarily and will cause severe complications and problems if it is used by someone who needs a custom built chair. All right, so this is why we drive everywhere. We This is why we avoid flying really at all possible costs and why I am officially on board as a person who d never wants to fly ever, 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 <sighs> ever again. I really don't. So we drive. We love it. We have everything that we need. We drive our Mini Coopers. It takes longer. So I have to get two weeks off because I can't just go on, we can't just go on a four day vacation. It would require renting a vehicle. I, I don't even want to talk about it. I don't even want to think about it. We bring our car with us everywhere and we would like to do some international travel. And so we are looking at boats. Yes, cruise ships. When those get going again, that is how we will be traveling internationally. No flights until they improve. And let me tell you, I do have the solutions. Here's how the airlines could improve. This is going to have to be some major changes in business, but you know what airlines, I know you can do it. And so I challenge you to think about this in a different way. So what has to happen? Well, flying in general has become an experience that nobody likes. It's usually awful. 
it's it's a flying bus in the air that's just no fun for anyone and so in order to make it better for people who are wheelchair users the aisle needs to fit a standard chair aisle needs to be lengthened so ada standards for a standard hallway for people to actually get by each other comfortably and for chairs to be able to go by either way 60 inches doorways need to be so doorways i think it's 36 inches but let me double check doorways for a ada doorways minimum clear opening of 32 inches and that's to fit a standard chair that's a bit tight i will say i i would prefer 36 inches because it depends on the chair being used measurement across is that really that difficult three feet 12 10, three feet across that's that shouldn't even be a problem it really really should not 36 inches wide yeah, stores and businesses use 36 inches however some older doors are less 36 inches okay make your aisles 36 inches so they at least accommodate someone's chair then you need to an option with room to move your legs and so that shouldn't be the exit row because then people are going to come up to us and be like if there's an emergency are you going to be able to assist other passengers no no we're not going to be able to okay however we like the extra room it's kind of essential that's needed you need more seats with more room sorry you're not going to be able to cram as many people into these flights but maybe you could even charge a little bit more for them and they would come out to be pretty decent i would say all right so then you need oh you need seats that can recline back and move up at will so people need to be able to do weight shifts so they don't come home with massive skin problems so it would be great if the seats would just move around and recline everywhere be more cushy and comfortable it's gonna cost money lots of money yeah you gotta invest in this then you need to be able to keep your wheelchair on the aircraft and this isn't below people need to be able to see their chairs period end of story they need to be nearby where they can see them where they can access them this is so important that i can't even tell you i mean maybe it needs to even be engineered so people can just stay in their wheelchairs for the flights and not have to transfer into a chair that might be another idea and i know there's such intelligent engineers and people who can figure this out i know you can do it so so i challenge you please please do this bathrooms bathrooms on the aircraft need to be ada accessible they need to have a separate bathroom for people or wheelchair users where they can actually roll their chair into the bathroom where they can do what they need to do in the bathroom and they can come out and come back to their seat so yes bathrooms bathrooms are important and if you take someone's chair and stow it below i i mean i can't believe it, now that i'm talking about it that we would even do this like why would we even tolerate this at all <laughs> going to the bathroom okay yeah so let's talk about going to the bathroom so mm -hmm. i'll get one of these on the aircraft you know and then suddenly okay chris's bag needs to be emptied i better down this shit because he ain't getting up to go to the bathroom this is my new bottle i'm gonna have to to do some crazy maneuvering to get below and get the end of his leg back in here and empty it for some nice gatorade mm -hmm. yeah then that's my gatorade walk around with a warm bottle of gatorade or hey whatever whatever i can find starbucks today this is what i have so yeah we're gonna be <laughs> i'm gonna have to down that down that drink i better be ready to empty discreetly so no one can see or he's going to dehydrate himself which is what he usually does so he's not going to drink anything so that he doesn't even have to go to the bathroom during the flight and then we have to deal with the consequences of dehydration so it's super fun i just that's why we don't fly but i look forward to new solutions for the future in equity club where we have diversity equity and inclusion Thank you very much. Laters, please uh, subscribe somewhere below. Like this video if you found it helpful, which I, these are good conversations to have. These are really, really good. I love this. So let's have more of these discussions. Please come on over to my channel and I'll be sharing more with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me.